father, mother, bro dear brothers and sisters and dear friends, uh, Christ is, is risen. Who is risen? Is risen. No, it's uh, the good novel. Uh, Bishop Luke gave me a complete freedom to choose the theme of this uh, uh, lecture and I choose to speak of uh, current uh, and important theme is the theme of transhumanism but I have connected it with uh, what we have uh, been living in the last weeks with the great events uh, of our salvation and also divinization by our Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the title of the lecture is Divinization in the Christian Project and as the Christian project and model of true transhumanism. During recent decades, uh, various theories have been developed in the United States and then spread throughout the Western world. Theories linked to what is called the transhumanist current. This current aims at going beyond the limits of man. This overcoming is designated in English by the word enhancement, which means improvement or increase. As this dual meaning already shows, this overcoming is envisaged in various degrees, which can go from a simple remedy for disease, this or infirmities, up to a transformation of the species and the creation of a superman, that is to say, a human being having capacities and competence superior to those of man in his present state. This current has two foundations. First, although it is referred to a transhumanism or it is referred to as transhumanism or posthumanism, it is globally rooted in the humanism born in the Renaissance and developed in the 18th century by the Enlightenment, that is to say, in a conception that considers man as existing in an absolute way, independently of God, for which there can be no supernatural contribution, but only a cultural contribution, that is to say, coming, coming from social productions. Second, this current is essentially linked to, technolo to technological progress with the idea that uh, it is above all by means of new technologies, in particular robotics, computer science, and genetics, that man can be improved, enhanced, transformed, and surpassed. In this sense, it has a materialistic base. Insofar as technologies are based on science, and transhumanism believes that solutions to almost all of, if not all, of man's problems can be brought about by technological progress based on scientific progress. It is also rooted in scientism, a philosophical current born at the end of the 19th century, according to which any problem of human existence is likely to find, now or in the future, a solution in scientific knowledge. Also, also the transhumanist movement, and in particular, the theories of enhancement, are ultra-modern and even futuristic. We can see that their foundations are old since they are based on the humanism of the Renaissance, the rationalism of the Enlightenment, and the scientism of the 19th century, as well as the technologism born at the same period. 
in relation to its very foundations, transhumanism and its correlates present, however, a certain number of weaknesses. First, humanism as a moral ideal, ideal is undermined by transhumanism insofar as by increasing it increases the share of technological instrumentation in the physical and psychic functioning of the human being. It reduces at the same time the share of humanity and could, at the end of its logic, lead to a world without, without humans, to use the title of a recent National Geographic documentary. Second, the scientific rationality on which the technologism of transhumanism rests in it is undermined by the strong share of illusion that a transhuman world includes currently and probably forever much more imaginary than real. In this respect, transhumanism is in large part more science fiction than science into the imagined world that it develops, a certain number of human fantasies are projected, such as the desire for perfection, physical, psychic, and intellectual, omnipotence and immortality acquired by human means. Third, transhumanism shows itself blind to the limits of technology in the face of the aging of the human body as a whole and to death, which constitutes the inevitable horizon of human life. On the one hand, the project to replace organs obtains positive results when it is a question of skeletal parts, knees, shoulders, hips, and so on, or of the heart and blood circulation, valves, arteries, but poses delicate problems in the case of organ transplants related to the phenomena of rejection. On the other hand, we can see how much the years gained in recent decades in terms of life expectancy are resulting in an increase in disabilities and, diversity and diseases related to brain degeneration, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, dementia, and so on, or genetic mutations, cancers, and so on, favored by the age of cells and the weakening of their self-preservation capacities as well as by the weakening of the Im immune system. It should be noted that life expectancy, which has been rising throughout the 20th century, has slowed in recent years in developed, in developed countries, due in particular to unfavorable <coughs> environmental factors, and has begun to decline in certain parts of the world. The recent COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated, accelerated this phenomenon. Fourth, instead of enhancing man, as it claims, transhumanism diminishes him because it focuses essentially on the performances or qualities of the body and thus amputates the human being for a great part of his psychic dimension and for the totality of his spiritual dimension. Five, fifth, insofar as it aims at improving man's psychic and intellectual capacities, it deals with them on an essentially quantitative level, having by its technical, technical, technological nature little influence on the qualitative. The alleged capacity of choice realized by means of computers is essentially a matter of classification and probabilities which remain in the domain of quantification. 
As for intellectual functions, they remain within the realm of, circula of calculation and are an improvement only from the point of view of speed, of the quantity of processed information, and with respect to logical rules posed, posed at the beginning. But they lack intelligence and comprehension in the sense of an apprehension of both the meaning of values and references to values. Six, whenever it aims at quality, as it is the case with genetics, transhumanism falls into questionable eugenicist practices, practices and would have choices depend and would have choices depend on individual criteria such as the desire or fantasy of parents or social criteria, for example, the need to have more girls or more boys, or, as we saw in the area of Nazism, the desire to obtain a pure race. These criteria are not only questionable from an ethical point of view, but are even external to the person concerned who is treated as an object. Seventh, the greatest weakness of transhumanism and human enhancement is that they envisage an impro improvement and augmentation of the human being without being able to pose and solve the problem of their meaning when they go beyond the limits of a therapeutic repair or recovery, or the problem of their value, or even, quite often, the simple problem of their utility. Eight, finally, transhumanism, apart from this last very particular and atypical case, a typical case of repair, poses a problem in relation to the Christian faith. This movement, which often takes the form of an ideology, is indeed positioned, if not against religion, at least at, as a substitute or ersatz for the latter and for a fu fundament, fundamental proposal of Christianity in particular, which is to allow us to pass beyond the limits of our current state, that of our fallen nature, and especially of the supreme limit of this state, which is death. This will become in, indirectly apparent in the course of my remarks, which will focus on the perfection of man and his overcoming as conceived by Christianity and more especially as theorized by the Greek fathers in their elaboration of Christian anthropology, particularly in their doctrine of the divinization of man, theosis in Greek. First point, the per paradisical state as the original normative state of humanity. For patristic anthropology, it is the paradisiacal state, the state of Adam and Eve before their sin, which initially constitutes the norm of ideal humanity. This state is partially revealed, revealed to us by the first chapters of the book of Genesis and by the commentaries of the fathers of the church. The basic fact is the creation of man in the image and likeness of God, which confers on man a certain ontological perfection and also a certain greatness, dignity, and value. There is then nothing bad in man according to what Genesis said, and God saw all the things that he had made and behold, they were very good. This means that man in a state, uh, is in a state that is the best possible at this moment of his existence, 
and that God has given him everything he needs on his part to realize the meaning of his life. The Bible and the Fathers tell us rather little about the original state of the human body, but all agreed that the human body possesses a number of divine qualities by participation, beauty but also as given by grace and linked to it as long as the first man remained united to God, incorruptibility and thus the absence of disease, infirmity, impassibility and thus the absence of pain and immortality According to St. Gregory of Nyssa and St. Maximus the Confessor, the original human body was material but did not have the density and thickness that he has today, which will also be the case in the re resurrected body that we can partially know from what the scriptures tell us about the body of the resurrected Christ which has the power to penetrate through doors or walls into a closed place, and which, uh, which, which can suddenly make itself invisible, or which possesses a, a capacity for translocation, that is to move without being subject to the constraints of space and time. In the eyes of the fathers, the image of God in man is manifested above all in his superior faculties, his intellect and his reason, his capacity for self-determination linked to his will, and his capacity to be free linked to the latter. Some fathers do not distinguish between image and likeness, but from Saint Irenaeus of, uh, of Lyon onwards, this distinction becomes common and while be, becomes common while the image constitutes the structural dimension of man and belongs to his nature the likeness constitutes his ethical and spiritual dimension and is characterized by the virtues also, the virtues are implant, implanted like germs in nature, their being set in motion and their development concerns the person, his disposition and his choice, uh, what uh, is in Greece, prioritizes. The image constitutes a stable and inalienable structure, the likeness is subject to the variation because it knows degrees. The image includes all the potentialities of nature to accomplish the likeness, and from this point of view, man lacks nothing to become what he should be, but this accomplishment correlatively supposes the contribu contribution of grace which is the only real increase necessary for man's perfection and the realization of his divine goal. Contrary to popular opinion, the Greek fathers do not conceive of the paradisiacal state of human nature as a state of perfection. The human body and all the faculties of man have their limits linked to his condition as a creature and to the properties of his species. As a created being, man is relative, God only, God alone being absolute. Like all other creatures, man answers to a certain definition, a word which less let us recall, comes from the Latin finis, which means limit, boundary, or frontier, which St. Maximus the Confessor calls logos, and which defines man one, man's one essence. From the spiritual, spiritual point of view, the fathers see man in his original state as not so much in a state of perfection, as 
in a dynamic process of perfection. Several fathers explained that original or ancestral sin occurred shortly after man came into existence because he was still a child, not experienced, immature, and therefore easily susceptible to temptation. In his Ambigua to John, Saint Maximus the Confessor developed a criticism of the originist conception of Gnostic origin, according to which man would have been originally in a quasi-divine condition from which he would have fallen following an original movement due to satiety. satiety, satiety. For Saint Maximus, movement is not a negative reality, an instrument and witness of a fall, but a positive means of progress originally given to an, in, to an imperfect man to move towards a perfection which is not behind him in a lost celestial state, but in front of him as an ideal to be achieved, that of becoming God by grace. This project of the divinization of man as an end suited to his nature was conceived by the word, the logos of God, before the ages and the ages and therefore before creation. It was inscribed at his creation in his very nature in what Saint Maximus calls his logos. This logos is on the one hand for man, as for any being, is essential definition, what situates him in his species and in his genus. We can note in passing that this divine foundation of the essence of each being gives it, gives it an absolute, sacred and intangible value which makes unacceptable any human attempt to modify a species as a whole or a particular being in its very nature. This Logos also expresses the essential relation to God in its origin and in its end, in its end of human nature and of each hypostasis that represents it and constitute for each person his duty to be or the norm of his fulfillment. This means that the development and fulfill, fulfillment of man can only take place within the framework of a relationship with God, that the relationship with God is inherent to the very nature of man, that for Christian anthropology there is no <coughs> such thing as a pure man, that is to say a man reduced to himself, and that for man to become more human is to become more divine. We shall see in what way. The process of divinization is initiated from the beginning by the movement that orients and makes man tend towards God, and that the person must accompany by, by a way of life in conformity with his nature, Cataphusin, say the Greek fathers, which consists mainly in the practice of the virtues according to a good disposition in harmony with the will of God. The spiritual growth of man by which he becomes more and more attuned to God, more and more like him, is the only process by which man can be enhanced and perfected. It is accomplished by a synergy of the will and the effort of the human person with divine grace, without which this effort would remain useless and without effect, because without the agreement of the human will manifested in its effort, the grace of God would remain 
in abeyance. Indeed, God cannot impose his will on man, whom he has created fundamentally free, and he wants the <coughs> divine good things he gives him to share, to become his own property, and not good things imposed from outside, because uh, then there would not be true good things for him, as St. Gregory the Theologian explains. Second point, the de diminished state of fallen man. Ancestral sin puts an end to this process and makes man not a normal man, deprived of his increase due to grace and reduced to his pure nature, as scholastic theology thinks, but a diminished man and even, as some father do not hesitate to say, subhuman. For example, St. Gregory of Nyssa said that after the sin, mal became uh, uh, as, uh, at the same level as animals and sometimes under this animal level. Corporally, man loses the qualities that grace had given to his nature, namely impassibility, incorruptibility, and immortality. He becomes subject to sickness, infirmities, suffering, and death. His body acquires a thicker materiality, symbolized in the book of Genesis by the tunics of, sin, of skin. Abandoning the virtuous way of life in accordance with, the with his nature, man gives himself up to the unnatural passions which are their antithesis. Whereas the virtues were various forms of attachment to God, defined by an activity of all his faculties directed towards him, these patients are so many forms of attachment of man to his ego, ego and <coughs> to, uh, on the one hand, and on the other, to the sensible world considered independently of God, according solely to its appearances and with the aim of drawing pleasure from it. In relation to these two forms of attachment, man's body plays an important role as a mediator. <coughs> pleasure, which replaces the original spiritual joy, from now on place, along with the pain which inevitably follows it, an essential role. What produces pleasure is considered as good, what provokes pain is, or displeasure is considered evil. The moral conscience, conscience is perverted. Man's intelligence and reason become invested in matter through, through the sense through the senses. They become despiritualized, despiritualized and divided and lose themselves in the multiplicity of material objects. Desire, turned away from God, is dispersed and alienated in sensible objects. The memory of God becomes the memory of the world, cluttered with a thousand useless objects. Imagination develops in an attempt to respond to the new needs that man has created for himself, serving to create the objects of desire when they are not given, which gives rise in collaboration with reason to the invention of technology, or to produce phantasm to fill, to fill in the, gap, the, the gaps. The will enters the service of patience or of the intelligence subjected to patience and becomes alienated by them. The diminishment that affects man on the physical, psychic, intellectual, ethical, and especially spiritual levels seems considerable since certain fathers, like St. Gregory of Nyssa, consider that man 
who has lost his resemblance to God, has become like animals without reason. The fathers all paint a detailed picture of a sick and infirm humanity. This diminution of man does not consist for him in a loss of his human essence of, uh, or of his es essential definition, which St. Maximus the Confessor calls his Logos. Some father says in this respect that the image of God in man is not destroyed but obscured or, or blurred. This diminution consists in a negative alteration of his mode of existence, which is characterized by a mode of activity contrary to his nature, which is prejudicial to all his faculties, contrary to the fulfillment that they found in their normal exercise, in conformity with nature. This diminution is also characterized by a loss of the likeness of God that should be achieved in the practice of virtues. Finally, and this is the worst of all evils, it corresponds to a loss of grace due to the mere fact that man has voluntarily turned away from God who was its source. It is by this turning away that the father generally qualify Adam's sins, sin, which is explained, explained both by an ignorance of God, which is not simply intellectual and passive, but voluntary and active, and by a seduction by sensible pleasure, dry, drawn by means of the senses from sensible objects. Saint Maximus the Confessor emphasized the role of philotia, of selfish love of self, and with most of the fathers, the role of pride closely linked to it. The sin of Adam, Saint, says Saint Maximus, consisted in self-deification, that is, in the will, according to the promise of the devil, to be like God, and this by his own strength, without God and outside of God, instead of becoming God through God, for God, with God, and in God. Now, it seems that we find this with very rare exceptions in the transhumanist movement, movement which intends to do without God and to find in human scientific and technical resource alone the means to reach a certain perfection in the exercise of our human faculties and to overcome the limitation inherent in current human nature. The goal is no longer to live eternally in God, but to enjoy one's own body and one's own faculties within the limits of the surrounding world. Third point, the futile attempt at restoration under the old covenant. The, the effects of Adam and Eve's sin in imprinted in the human nature of which they were the first representative, are transmitted to their descendants through bio biological, that is to say genetic, begetting, and are confirmed, confirmed and developed by their own sins and patience. The law of the, the old co covenant provides man with the means of a certain ethical and spiritual rectification that the writers the writer and the prophets have accomplished to a certain, sometimes quite lofty extent. Yet human nature remains ontologically sick and a number of fathers show the prophets deploring this 
but remaining unable to remedy it. On example, one example is Jeremiah's words, we have healed Babylon and she has not recovered. Origen notes that all the remedies offered were far below what the healing of mankind, mankind required. Fourth point, reparation and enhancement through Christ. The same fathers emphasize that only Christ, because he was God, was able in coming among men to bring a remedy commensurate with their ills. But he had to be wholly human as well, for, according to the words of St. Gregory the Theologian, what was not assumed could not be healed either. Christ, by the power of his divinity, accomplished in the human nature, which he assumed in its entirety, apart from sin, the healing of all mankind, that is to say, of all men of all times, which that nature recapitulates. This healing is usually design, des, designated by the word salvation, but let us remember that the Greek word sozain, to save, also means to heal. This healing, however, is often expressed by the Holy Fathers in terms of recovery compared to the deviations introduced by sin and manifested by the patients and of restoration to man's originate state. Salvation is also a victory over the might of the evil powers of sin, corruption and death which were exercised over man. Alongside salvation, the Holy Father distinguished divinization, which consists in man's being assimilated to God and becoming God by grace in accordance with the vocation that God had assigned to him from the beginning. To take up the notion of enhancement, one could say that salvation brings an improvement in the form of a repair of what was deteriorated, a rectification of what is perverted, a restoration of what is altered, a healing of what is sin, a lifting up of what has fallen, a fortifying of what has been weakened, a quickening of what is dead. Deification, on the other hand, can be conceived as an increase insofar as it enables, enables man to receive by grace divine qualities that he does not possess and cannot himself acquire by nature because they exceed both his own strengths as to their mode of acquisition and the limits of, their, of his essence as to their nature. Fifth point, divinization. The theme of divinization, theodis in Greek, is seldom referenced, referenced in the Latin tradition, but it occup occupies an essential place in the theology of the Greek fathers. This concept is not of late, of late appearance, since it is already present in the writing of the Apostolic Fathers. It becomes clearer in their immediate successors. It develops among the first Alexandrians and becomes considerably more precise among the great doctors of the Church who combat Arianism and its posterity. This theme is found in the 7th century as the center of the great synthesis of St. Maximus the Confessor, often called the Doctor of Divinization, 
who clarifies it from a metaphysical, Christological, anthropological and spiritual point of view. It is found in the great patristic recapitulation carried out by St. John Damascene in the 8th century before it finds new precisions in the 14th century with the theological developments of St. Gregory Palamas. The doctrine of divinization as a solid New Testament spiritual foundation which appears in the continuity of Old Testament teaching. This continuity is most priestly seen in John 10, uh, 34, where the formula of Psalm uh, 80 on 6 is taken up by Christ. I have said, you are God. The same Psalm in its first verse proclaimed, God stands in the assembly of gods, and in the midst of them will judge gods. These formulas as it are echoed by the Apostles Paul's twice repeat, repeated affirmation, we are of the offspring of God, we are, are the offspring of God. These formulas uh, do not represent an actual reality, but a potential one, and as expressed by the Apostle Peter's statement that through God's glory and power of action, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by this we might be partakers of the divine nature. Other formulas testify to an assimilation to Christ. For example, for as many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ in Galatian. I live, but uh, I live, yet not I, but, but Christ liveth in me. In Galatian. So. To the theme of divinization must also be linked that of creation of man in the image and likeness of God in Genesis, which we spoke of earlier, that of the filial adoption of man by God, that of the imitation of God to the point of becoming perfect as he is, and the promise of a future condition in which the faithful will participate in divine incorruptibility and immortality, in which he will find perfection in the vision of God, who will assimilate him to himself, in which he will be glorified in his might. You find uh, uh, this uh, assertion in different, diverse uh, points of the Holy Testament. Some of these themes were certainly already present in certain currents of Hellenism, which sometimes earned the Greek father the, the suspicion of being influenced by it. The idea of likeness to God, the ideal as assigned to man of a divine perfection, its <coughs> fulfillment through the imitation of God, the affirmation of the possibility for man to participate not only in divine good things, but also in divine qualities, notably the enjoyment of immortality, that knowledge of God which assimilates the, knower, the knower to the known. However, beyond these analogies, there are profound differences where the specificity of the Christian conception is affirmed and where the full reality of the divinization that it assumes the, as the finality of Christian existence is justified. At the center of the Christian conception of divinization is the fact of the incarnation of the world, the Son of God, to whom everything is subordinated 
According to a formula used by most of Greek fathers, God became man so that man might become God, which means that the divinization of man is the reason is the raison d'être, the ultimate purpose of the incarnation, but also that it is the incarnation which makes divinization possible. From then, on the Christian ideal of, ideal of divinization reveals, reveals its specificity, the likeness to God achieved by imitation of God in the virtues is the likeness to Christ that is accomplished by imitation of Christ, the source and model of all virtues. Participation in the divine good things is particip participation in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Incorruptibility and immortality, eschatology, eschatological attributes of the saved and deified man are not properties of his own nature, but gift of God. Moreover, they are received not only by the soul, but by the body, this body aided by the Platonic tradition and the Gnostic currents. And this is by the grace of Christ, who became incarnate, that is to say, he put on not only a soul, but a human body, overcame corruption and death, and rose from the dead, allowing all men to share in the, benef to share in the benefits of his saving economy. The precision that it is by grace that, is complete, that the completed Christian becomes God in essential is is essential and is found in all the fathers. On the one hand, man is unable to accomplish his deification by himself. This is beyond his own strength, for man cannot grant himself a state which is beyond his nature, another difference with the pagan philosophies, which for the most part considered that the soul was divine by nature and saw in divinization an accomplishment of its own activity through an effort at purification. It is thus by divine energy alone or divine activity designated as grace when it acts, it acts towards man that diviniza divinization is accomplished. Man by renouncing to exercise the energy of its, of its own faculties and by the ecstatic renunciation of himself, opens himself, himself freely to the action of the divine energy which unites, unites him to God and transforms him into a God by grace. On the other hand, the affirmation of a divinization by grace, that a father like St. Gregory the Theologian and St. Maximus the Confessor will all, also say by participation or by institution, in the sense that it is a state eta established by God, allows one to stress that deified man never becomes God by nature or by essence, but remains a human being and a human person. The Father thus distanced themselves from any pantheistic or fusional conception, which was not the case for the ancient philosophical or religious currents, which also developed the theme of deification. In divinization, where man is truly transformed, where he becomes truly a god by reaching a divine state, he nevertheless remains man. Here we have a paradox that some fathers have tried to resolve. Distinguishing between the definition of nature of essence or essence, logos this physios or logos this in Greek, and the mode 
of existence, tropos tis hypoxios in Greek, Saint Maximo the Confessor explained that the div divinized man remains what he is according to the first one, in other words, preserves what es essentially defines his being, but is transformed according to the, con the second one, in other words, accesses another state or another modality of his being. Several fathers express this by the metaphor of iron heated by fire, which acquires the quality of fire, heat, luminosity, while remaining iron. To use the terminology of enhancement, we can say that there is a real perfecting and increase of the human being that elevates him beyond his natural condi condition and goes so far as to confer divine qualities on him. From a certain point of view, there is an overcoming of humanity and its natural limits. But from another point of view, the essence of man is respected his essential definition is not modified, which constitutes a first difference compared to the majority of the transhumanist theories, which intend to create uh, technologically or genetically a totally different human being, a being of another nature of, or essence, hence the name of uh, the name post-humanism is sometimes given to these theories, and the name cyborg or cyborg is given to this being of another nature whose parents are genetics, robotics, and computer science. As we have said, the grace of divinization is acquired by the by we humans through the saving economy of Christ, who in his person has united human nature to divine nature and has transformed, saved, and divinized our nature by the power, the power of his divinity. People receive the grace of salvation and divinization by being grafted into the body of Christ, that is, by becoming members of the Church. The grace of divinization is received in the mysteries of fundamental sacraments, baptism, chrismation, or an Eucharistic communion, where the faithful receive Christ, Christ himself, who penetrates their soul and body. The Christian must, however, appropriate and assimilate this grace personally by uniting himself to Christ, who is united to him, and this by leading a life in conformity with Christ. This is achieved by doing his will, by practicing his commandments, precepts of life that allow him to be purified of patience and to imitate Christ by living according to the virtues of which Christ is the model, the source, and the essence. Divinization is progressively accomplished in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Many fathers insist on the essential role that the Holy Spirit plays in deification. It is he who assimilates the faithful to Christ, and in him unites them to the Father. Because the human being is inseparably soul and body, it is both in his soul and, and his body that the Christian can be deified. According to a formula of St. Maximus the Confessor, which summarizes patristic teaching well, well Man will remain woolly man in soul and body, owing to his, to his nature, but will become woolly God in soul and body, 
owing to the grace and the splendor of the blessed glory of God, which is wholly appropriate to him and beyond which nothing more splendid or sublime can be imagined. Imagine it. Divinization allows man to be no longer subject to the laws that govern this world, notably to material, psychic, and social determinations. St. Maximus the Confessor stresses in particular the fact that the divinized man transcends the categories of space and time. It should be noted, however, that the sanctified Christian can only receive the first fruits of salvation and divinization here on earth, but will only receive the, their fullness at the end of the time and in the, and in the hereafter. He can experience a total spiritual transformation here below in the ultimate experience of the vision of God, but this experience, also repeatable, remains short-lived. And as I have shown in my book, The Theology of Illness, Christianity has not only never opposed such measures, but has encouraged them. But the idea developed by transhumanism that all failing parts of the human body could be indefinitely <coughs> replaced, that all suffering could be abolished, and that, that the limits of death could be indefinitely pushed back is totally illusory from the point of view of Christian theology. Faced with these unsurpassable limits of bodily life in the fallen world, Christian spirituality has, however, provided the Christian with spiritual means so as not to be on the spiritual level, which is any, in any case essential, subject to the power of <coughs> suffering, corruption, and death. Before the saving economy of Christ was accomplished, the power of death was not only exercised by constituting, constituting a definitive end of life, but by, but by the fear it inspired. In this regard, Theodore of Mopsuestia <laughs> and St. John Chrysostom put forward the idea that all the evil passions of man are developed by him as an attempt to escape death. In the same way, suffering exercised dominion over man, characterized in particular by the power to turn him away from God or to <coughs> destroy his inner life. Before assuring men of incorruptibility and immortality in the world to come, Christ's victory over suffering and death in his passion and death on the cross has granted them, if they unit, unite themselves to him and receive his grace, a spiritual victory over suffering and death, so that suffering and death already in the present life lose their sting, as the Apostle Paul, Paul says. When they are assumed into Christ, illness, suffering, and the various trials and tribulations of human existence can acquire a positive meaning and value, helping the person to be shaped and progress to be shaped and progress spiritually. And in a general way, the weakness so despised by those who make an ideal of man's omnipotence becomes for man the state in which the strength of God is best manifested, manifested as says the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. This Transfiguration of consequences of the fall is also an important part of the enhancement, perfectibility, and increased proposed by Christianity in the present.
that we are living and by means accessible to all. Now my, my conclusion. In conclusion, I would like to note that the transhumanist current globally presents itself as a secularized humanist, as a secularized, secularized humanist and materialist substitute as that for the Christian project of transcending the limits of our present nature. It embodies in our time the myth of Prometheus and understood within the framework of the Christian anthropology that I have just defined, it reproduces Adam's sin of wanting to be a perfect and all-powerful powerful being, in other words, a God outside of God and without God by his own physical and intellectual abilities and power. Even so, it is possible as a Christian to support within the framework, however, of an ethic respectful to the human person, this enhancement in its restorative aims in relation to diseases and infirmities, which is achieved naturally without the support of an ideology by medicine and by techniques that it uses. But it is not possible to support the transhumanist project in its will to create a new man very largely dehumanized and, and subject to goals defined either by the individual egoism that derived from what we call passions or by collective interest of economic groups sellers or exploiters of the implemented techniques, or by ideologies or imaginative productions whose phantasms try to satisfy at the price of dangerous illusions and serious disappointments the ideal of perfection that Christianity proposes unfortunately only timidly in our secularized societies. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.